if you're not familiar, um, I think we have some newcomers here. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and Agitari a little bit and then talk about why we're here and let uh, Alex introduce herself. Uh, so I'm Daniel Holter. I am a uh, I am a facilitation and sense making enthusiast, um, a hobbyist uh, who has talked my way way into making it an aspect of my job in the U.S. Air Force. So I uh, am originally from the Intel community, um, but I got into innovation. Uh, stood up a innovation cell, which led me to sense making and design practices, such as you get through various uh, Steve Blanks and and design thinking gurus and uh, and UX design and and all of that stuff. And and I saw a lot of value from a lot of places, but people saying that their particular niche was the was the magic bullet for solving problems or for designing products. Um, and uh, but the the, I'd say the commercial aspect of this lends them to have a uh, to be compelled to say that theirs does something unique to the ones that the other ones don't do, and it's why you have people saying, "Oh no, I'm I'm lean startup and design thinking sucks," or "No, I'm UX design design thinking sucks." Most of them agree that design thinking sucks, but most of them are using straw man versions of what design thinking is. Uh, if you go through IBM's enterprise design, for example, or or Darden's, um, Darden's Summer of Design program, or the D School is what most people are familiar with. There is variance across them, um, and there's a lot of value to be taken. And they work in different contexts. Bounded applicability, as we use in the complexity theory space, right? So Agitare was built to be a community of practice for people who want to learn a variety of different sense-making tools. So we have people within the community who are really into futures, uh, strategic foresight practices. Um, I, I'm a big fan of uh, sense-making and complexity frameworks, such as you get from, from Kinevin or Ways Finding and Sonia Blignacht and, uh, and Nora Bateson and, and all of them. So I like to share a lot of stuff in Slack that uh, alludes to their stuff. At times, the Agitari community has been very active with uh, live, you know, these kinds of synchronous events. Um, in recent months, it has been relatively quiet because people get drawn back to their own corners, their institutions pull their energy back, and that's fine, it's to be expected. Um, and then it turns into sort of an asynchronous community of, of practice, and that has continue to prove valuable to me so long as I am staying engaged there. So we ask everybody who is within the community to remember that it is their participation that keeps things vibrant and, uh, and vital. Um, so if you're, if you're all sitting around waiting for the activity to start, um, you are all simultaneously experiencing and part of the problem. And the way to see more activity is to start more activity. So if you are interested in doing more synchronous and activities, I'm always eager to jump in and, and help with that. Um, we have some resources like this Zoom and paid, you know, resources at our, um, at our disposal too. Um, and like, you know, marketing and a pretty big audience and newsletters and stuff if we choose to use them. I think that's enough on Agitare. Um, so today's event it was inspired. I think I saw Alex Zuckerman uh, do a Federal Innovator Salon event uh, about games and how games can be purposeful in helping people to um, helping them to uh, uh, grow skills as individuals or increase or improve interpersonal dynamics. Um, I see this as sort of analogous to the ways that we think about workshop design, if you're a workshop designer and facilitator, you're creating a separate space where you are specifically constraining and driving the rules to be a particular way for an effect for interpersonal, um, you know, effects, but also to change the ways you change the rules and it changes the way that people engage within that context. So that's how workshops work. I also am an avid tabletop gamer. 
So it's how I've always seen board games to work. It's just a very constrained environment that creates really interesting effects. Um, and they can be very powerful and they can create lasting effects for people and for relationships. So I was excited to get into it. Alex and I have had a couple of uh, conversations on this. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Alex to do a quick intro on uh, herself and and her work. Um, and then we'll and then we'll get into the agenda. Perfect. Um, so I'm Alex Zuckman. I'm in Washington, D.C. I uh, am a facilitator and uh, co-founder of this company, Barometer XP. That is, we say, we're the science of play at work, how to use games and play to leverage stronger relationships, to bring different strengths and skills out of people um, as, you know, be, to be used all throughout the learning and development cycle, um, while also having the benefit of being very connecting and a force for bringing joy and laughter into the workforce, which is so important for culture building and trust and psychological safety and all those things that they're starting to be more attention paid to and, and being seen as not just the like fluffy kumbaya nice to have, but really essential to getting uh, high performance and great buy-in and, and great leadership. Um, I did not start out in this space at all. I was in uh, very DC fashion in public policy for over 10 years um, in the health and social policy primarily. Um, but what I noticed and got really dismayed about pretty early in my career was how dysfunctional the workplace was. And you had all these people that were really smart and really believed in the mission of the work and in uh, improving, it was doing domestic policy at the time, it's improving uh, the country and, and sort of quality of life for people in the country and very important work, but it was so chaotic and reactive. And the way that uh, people are trained to, to have sort of a specialty area in their job made it very isolating and hard to collaborate and communicate. And those skills were not developed at all. And the processes and tools in place um, made it harder to coordinate across positions and, and to really build strong relationships and connections. And I got pretty obsessed with that and shifted my career into organization development because I wanted to solve that problem. And initially did that within the company I was working, then went out on my own. And it, it's just a massive problem uh, and continues to be a massive problem. And in thinking about how do you get people willing to change their behavior and bought into the fact that um, you can't just say, I do everything right. I do everything perfectly. It's everybody else who has the problem and who needs to change. Um, but to take some ownership for the way things are and the way they want the culture to be and the experience of work to be. And a huge piece of that is self-awareness. And, and I don't think there's a whole lot of opportunities for people to practice being reflective and, and self-aware in the workplace. And through a bunch of uh, different introductions and connections, met one of my co-founders who is a game designer and not video games or computer games, but very experiential games. And we really hit it off and started toying around with the idea of how do you bring games and play into the workplace to make more space for that reflection and connection and to get into building those interpersonal skills that are so essential for uh, for culture and for, for performance and retention, engagement, all of those things. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm going to do very little talking, actually. It's going to be much more um, showing and experiencing together. We're going to play a couple different games, and I'll point out how to use those games for different types of uh, insights and different types of learning within within the team environment. What a, my company wants to do is um, kind of combat the idea of forced fun and awkward social uh, or learning activities in the workplace. There's, I, we probably all have stories of being part of some activity that was not well run and ended up being, I mean, awkward at best, but maybe even in, introducing some new tensions 
um, or, or friction points uh, because it was not done well. And so that's where, as we say, the science of play work, the science piece comes in is how do you, can you be really methodical in selecting the right game for the types of learning or development outcomes you're trying to get? And how can you facilitate the experience to make it meaningful and draw people's attention um, to, to the right game mechanics and the right experience of it? <laughs> um, this is going to be really interactive. We're going to be doing a lot of playing and reflecting and, and conversing. Um, want this to be very interactive and, um, you know, for you to get a lot out of it, feel, please feel free to jump in and ask questions, to be in the chat, um, to share insights or ideas that come up as we're talking. Uh, this is very much for you. Yeah, I just wanted to, this is like uh, something you mentioned about forced fun uh, activities, often not creating the effects that you want. This is something I've been thinking about, and I just wanted to highlight really quick before we jump into it, because I, when I think that was the last time we talked, I brought up this Cars quote, this James Cars quote from Finite and Infinite Games, which is the, which is the philosophical framework that Simon Sinek uh, stole uh, in order to write his book, The Infinite Game. Um, so definitely read the original. But he talks about finite versus infinite games, and and in in infinite games. Uh, there's a playfulness, which is like a posture, right? Um, and it, and I've I often think about playfulness at work as this posture that we can have towards one another, which allows, you know, in, in Cars's words, he says that um, it allows the relationship to be open to surprise, right? It creates opportunity for, you know, if you're in the design or the cre creativity space, it creates opportunity for lateral thinking. Right. So I think about relationships that I have in work, at work, which are playful and often they are with the people with whom I am the most collaborative, but it relies on that like posture of playfulness. Like we have to be in that state. It's not just that we're doing the moves. And when you say forced play, I, I always think, oh, you're trying to make the thing happen without the posture, right? Without people being in that state, um, which is, I, I think, super important. Yeah, that's a great point. And I really like uh, what Ethan put in the chat there, the term icebreaker. I don't like that term either. Is it to me, it's like once you've broken the ice, it's done. And it, it, you know, it's just about that initial step. And what are you breaking the ice for? I like to think more about a catalyst and how do you use an activity or an exercise to get people um, in the right mind space for whatever is going to come next or to uh, get them to let their guard down a little bit, to to trust each other and be willing to be vulnerable um, and be open to, to whatever the experience is. And without cultivating that mindset, you're really just talking to brick walls the whole time and, and you're not gonna have any impact. So I like this idea of a catalyst and, and then you can be really purposeful. What is it you're trying to catalyze? Um, all right. And so if people want to, it's totally fine to engage however you want. If you want to stay off camera, that's fine. If you want to come on camera, turn your audio on, um, whatever uh, whatever is most comfortable for you. Uh, for a couple of the activities, if you have a paper and pen handy, uh, it will be uh, helpful. All right. So let me dive in. One of the ways to be purposeful with uh, play is to think about how, what are you trying to use it for? What are you trying to catalyze? And what's the outcome that you're looking to get? And this is the first mistake I think a lot of people use when they bring in some type of game is they don't think about why are we doing this particular activity? If you're asking people to, to play a game or any type of exercise, one, you're asking them to invest time. Two, there's a level of vulnerability because even if it's an activity they've done before, even if they know the people, you don't know what's gonna happen. That's sort of what makes any type of play play is that it's not completely prescribed and there's room for you know, serendipity and uncertainty. And so if you're gonna do that, you need to make people feel comfortable that, that you're using their time well, that you're they're gonna get something out of it. 
And so thinking about what level of depth do you want people to be thinking and reflecting and ideating in as you're playing? We have, we call it the iceberg model because there's an iceberg and there's different levels of depth. And on the surface level, and this is where uh, either an icebreaker or an opening activity, or if you're not really looking to get deep into learning and development, but just wanna have fun and build trust and psychological safety and familiarity, um, you'd wanna be in this top layer, which is bonding or team bonding, um, where there's not a lot of reflection, but really just the value of being together is important. And these might be things, you know, like happy hours where there's a trivia or, you know, team going bowling or just some social activity. Even if you're not trying to get deep, you still want to be purposeful about it. You want to make sure that the activity is going to facilitate the types of interactions that you want people to have. Uh, I was doing a workshop yesterday and um, a person who has been in the corporate space for a long time talked about how many times at a company she used to work for, they would go bowling and it was like, oh, it's supposed to be really fun. But bowling, while you're with other people, doing the activity itself is an individual activity. One person goes up at a time and everyone else is watching. And people can also you know, get up and go get food and have side conversations. So there's not really an opportunity for everybody to do something together unless you have somebody who's facilitating the conversation and keeping everybody involved. So that was an example of while well-intentioned, maybe not the best activity because of the, the mechanics of the activity itself uh, for that purpose. So you can still be very intentional when you pick an activity. Um, the next layer down uh, is team building and that's building stronger connections between people within a team, within a work environment. And you're playing the game, but you're adding a level of reflection to how do I show up in this situation? How do other people show up? What is it about this particular situation that affects how people show up? And you can, once you get into those conversations, you can get into, well, who are there certain conditions where some people thrive and other people um, feel very insecure or, um, you know, or triggered in some way? Are there people who maybe have complementary approaches that have never really come out before, but now that they know it, those insights are going to translate into how they work together. So it's using the game and using the reflection to look at how can people work together differently, understand each other better uh, for better work outcomes. And then the deepest level of the iceberg is team development. And that's where you're looking to do some sort of culture change or process change um, or larger development that's that's gonna affect the team as a whole. And so you're playing with the idea of how, what is this particular group of people with their backgrounds and their perspectives and, and their, their skills and their roles, what do they need to thrive and how do you practice new ways of working together and maybe new ways of communicating new processes in order to help them meet their shared goals better. So today we're actually gonna play one game for each of these categories. And we're gonna start with, um, with bonding. Um, but before we move on, I guess I'll just ask any questions so far, thoughts so far? All right, let me actually make sure I have the chat open just in case something comes up there. Um, but feel free to jump in and, and interrupt me um, if I don't see something in the chat. Yeah, so I'm the first- the, I'm watching the oh, chat perfect. as well. So I'll I'll just shout that out, but um, feel free to speak up. Thanks. Oh, Austin oh, raised uh, Austin, hand. yeah. Sorry, I'm struggling because I'm in from my phone and not from my computer. Um, so as you mentioned sort of the the iceberg here, you're also mentioning how uh, what I'm getting is the idea that you need progressively deeper sense of reflection as to like the, the, the degree of participation. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I was making sure that I understand that point correctly because that, that does have some pretty significant implications. The, the level of reflection needed, not just from the participants, 
but from those who are going to be involved in the implementation of you know this this play is going to be progressively deeper requires a deeper level of reflexivity the, the deeper you go I just want to make sure I understood that point correctly yeah absolutely and I'm going to talk more about uh the type of reflection at the deeper levels in a little bit but that that's a really great observation um okay, and part you. of one of the analogies that I like to give about the reflection and and the depth is like imagine like a heist movie and there's that scene towards the end where the thief or the team of thieves whatever they're in the vault and you can see they could see the object that it is they're trying to steal and it looks like they can just go up and get it but there's they there's those laser wires there that they have to navigate in between and unless they use that flashlight that shows those wires you don't really know that there's all of these obstacles there. And I think that's how a lot of teams operate is there's all these really complicated dynamics, some of which can create tension, um, but a lot of which can be in um, create more connection, better collaboration, better understanding. But if you don't know that they're there and you're not being strategic and how you're leveraging them or avoiding them, you're just going to keep making the same mistakes or, or missing the same opportunities over and over and over again. And so getting people into this reflective state, um, it, it's really easy through, through the course of a game because you're setting up this shared experience for people to start to say, oh, I noticed that when I'm getting instructions for a new game, it's much more helpful for me to see them written down rather than somebody just telling me. And that's a really big insight to have if you're a manager of that team or if you're a project leader and you're communicating instructions about a project. If somebody responds better to written instructions, that's something very tangible that you can do that's going to get better outcomes. And so just having people reflect on the situation and what are the what are the different mechanics, what are the different aspects of the situation that affect how they show up and how they perform? Most of the time, there's a direct analogy to something that that happens in the workplace or that affects how the work is done. And, and so they're really powerful and valuable insights. Yeah, I kind of want to I, I add to that because I've explored the idea that intimacy is a prerequisite um, for certain interpersonal effects. Um, and I think it came from Benita Roy talking about intimacy within a, a, uh, like a facilitation context. You, you, um, you, intimacy is what causes the, 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 uh, she's like, it's when our identities become permeable. Right. Um, and we have the capacity to create, for example, emergent effects where, you know, when Austin and I are collaborating, we often, the outcome of our collaboration is not attributable to one or the other of us. Austin, I hope, I know I'm making a weird example by using the two of us, but it's the best example I can think of where- I about take the credit all the time. Yeah, you're welcome to take the credit, but it's not all yours. I could, uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, but when you get a group of people together who are, and you generate that sense of intimacy, which is this interpersonal effect- um, they are capable of producing effects which are one greater than the sum of their parts, right? So, so information was generated that didn't belong to any one person. Um, but it as a prerequisite, and I like Austin brought up that top one and the you know the layers of depth that are kind of depicted in that. Um, and so I often it, again, this is about postures, right? Which I brought up as a posture of playfulness. But I also wanted to bring up what, um, oh, my printer's making noise. Bring up what Ethan said in the chat, which is examples of team building in um, how people do that every day. Because I think I've experienced that where um, in addition to this posture of playfulness where you're just, it, for example, in our uh, in our office, it's kind of weird. There's a few of us who play free association games, which to me is just from a posture of playfulness where we've established these patterns of interaction, which result in a lot of 
laughter, which to me increases, you know, what I see is that it increases intimacy. It makes us more comfortable engaging in difficult things it, it and collaborative tasks. But mostly you don't see that in most of the places that I've worked. So we're constantly trying to like Austin and, and me and, and some of our coworkers, we're constantly injecting little games into uh, the ways that we do work. And some of that is like we compete Wordle or, you know, just share how we did on Wordle. And it it is it is sort of parallel play in that regard. It's not exactly playing together, but um, it's a, it, to me, it has become what I would consider like a best practice in inserting games into the regular interactions, um, even if they're tiny ones. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And part of of the bonding is helping people co colleagues find things to talk about outside of just their work. Um, so for creating that trust, for creating that intimacy, it, it, that's really important is to start to see the other dimensions of who we all are as people. And you know, whether it's an official game or just something that's playful, uh, it's setting up a shared experience. Um, and that that is really valuable. That's a great point, Daniel. So the first game we're going to play is categories or variation of categories. I don't know if people play this. It was really big in like the 90s. I think it's still a pretty prominent board game. Um, but we're going to do two rounds of it with slight differences. And the reason I chose this game is it just gets people thinking in different ways and you could see how people think, uh, you know, what, what comes to mind. Um, and then it's also an opportunity to learn a little bit about each other. So, I think just reflecting on the two rounds again, because this is team bonding, we're not going super deep, but just want to know, like, how was that? What were you thinking um, in the rounds as you're playing? What were you feeling during that game? So one thing I think about a lot with things that increase intimacy is the degree of discomfort. Um, games are often awkward and uncomfortable, even when they're fun or between mm -hmm. moments of fun, like there's punctuated uh, enjoyment, but often between those, there's like a lack of <clears throat> like fluidity, you know, periods of silence. So something I always notice with these sorts of things. And I always wonder how uncomfortable different people are. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great observation. It's a great thing to bring people's attention to and try to encourage people to speak up about what makes them uncomfortable. For some people, it's silence. For some people, it's pacing if something's going too slow or going too fast. For some people, it's if if certain players tend to dominate the conversation and not leave space for anybody else. Kind of along the lines of what Halter was saying, I think about with games and with collaborative work, how much relies on the ability to admit when you don't know something and how uncomfortable yeah. that makes people. And so even something as simple as saying like, oh, I couldn't think of a word in this category that starts with this letter. You know, it's it's very interesting how counterintuitive it feels to some of us. I won't speak for everybody, <laughs> but just to be like, yeah, I, I couldn't do that in 60 seconds. Like, it's a very simple thing, but uh, the constraints of the game can make it feel challenging, even where it otherwise might not be. So that was very interesting. Yeah, that's such a great point. And ability or willingness to say, I don't know, or I didn't understand, or I couldn't do it is one of the key concepts in psychological safety. And so just seeing, can people express that in a game or what is it, what type of agreement or um, understanding or level of, of implicit comfort do people need to feel uh, in order to say that and, and to talk about that 
within the context of a game um, as a way to, to practice it is an easier conversation to have than doing it within the context of work where the stakes are higher. That's a really great point, Lauren. I like that Ethan brought up gatekeeping around an answer uh, because I am known in my household and Rouse knows this. I am known as the person who cannot accept a game not going by the intent of the game designer. I'm like, it. we have to play it the way they intended us to play it. Even if that's not fun, it has to be what they made for us. It must be the experience that they, the experts, want us to have. And it, <laughs> it creates a little tension in my home. It's it's really it's especially interesting because in all other aspects of life, in my experience, you are among the most flexible humans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not in games. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I'm like, you know what? Someone smart created this experience for us and we're gonna have the experience they intended. I really do appreciate that level of respect that you have for these people. Yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm like, okay, now that I know how to play and I know the rules, um, what twists can we put on it either to make it more fun or more inclusive, uh, or in the case of some games, go by faster. That's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Once you get it down, you can kind of freestyle. So one thing I noticed in the game was it, when you're playing games with people, you tend to pay attention to them more and in different ways. Uh, you pay attention to everybody who's playing the game, which is very different from how we normally interact in like, for example, in the workplace, you pay attention to people based on their specific output. Right. So within a context, it, like a meeting, um, we don't pay attention to everybody at the meeting people are allowed to just kind of fade into the wallpaper um, unless they are in positions of institutional power. Um, but in, in games, there's a necessity or there's a demand that drives us to pay very close attention to one another, which I think is part of what drives the discomfort is that we're all paying really close attention. Yeah. But, and, and a point to that is, if you're in a meeting with people and it's people you don't know very well, or maybe you don't feel like you have that much um, sort of shared buy-in uh, or shared accountability, it's easier to tune out. But the more you can build those relationships with the people that you're meeting with, the more you'll feel like, oh, I should listen to what they're saying, whether it's out of respect or because or out of Oh yeah, like our work is is really closely related. We're, we're there's an interdependence there, so it, it it's valuable to me uh, to know what they're saying or to give feedback. Um, and so even just building using games or some other way of building up those relationships, um, so there is that that shared sense of of buying and accountability is really valuable. Um, and that's actually a great segue into. Uh, the next piece. So if you want to go down to the to the deeper levels of the icebergs beyond team bonding, we're going to building and development, you're going to bring in the experiential learning cycle, um, which is there's some experience or activity where you do something, reflecting on it is how did I feel? How did I think? What was it? Why did I do what I did? Um, I don't know why my slides keep advancing mysteriously. I need to keep my hands away from my desk. Um, then you conceptualize it, you put those reflections into context. So why was it that I felt this way or what made me think that particular thing? What greater meaning or, or broader patterns can you start to notice in those reflections? And then how do you apply them? Now that I know this, now that I understand there's this pattern, now that I saw that there were these different communication dynamics or uh, these different perspectives coming out. How do you do that? How can how can you use that? Um, for if you think back to that analogy of those laser wires, how can you better leverage the things that are going to help 
build trust or strengthen performance or strengthen accountability um, and avoid or mitigate the damage from uh, some of the differences, some of the challenges. And so the level of reflection is going to be a little bit deeper than just, hey, you know, what 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 came up? How was that? Did you like that? Uh, you're going to try to get into some of that understanding and recognizing of uh, of patterns. So now we're going to go into a game that could be used for team building, where there's more of an element of how am I thinking and why am I thinking or feeling that way, and how are other people, and what can we learn about each other, and to be a little bit more reflective on on how we show up and are there things that we can do in how we show up that would make a situation uh, more more engaging, more welcoming, more productive or effective for other people. So any questions before we go into the next game? All right, this is a game called Poetry for Neanderthals. Has ever, anyone ever played this? Uh, there's a board game version of it. Um, but what's going to be one person is going to take a turn being the poet. And uh, I will send the poet um, a series of words in the chat just to that one person. And the poet can only use one syllable words to try to describe and get people to guess what that word is. And you can string together a sentence, you can try to do synonyms, you can do a descriptor, any type of, of way of describing to try to have people guess that term, but it has to be one syllable. In the board game version, there's an inflatable club. And when somebody, when the poet gives uh, a multi-syllable word, every, you can like beat them with the club. Um, we don't have, that when we're playing virtually. Um, so there can be some sort of like public shaming if uh, if the poet uses a multi-syllable word, you can like shake your fists or yell boo or just call them out for it. Um, put shame in the so, chat. <laughs> yeah, put shame in the chat, that's a good one. Uh, does anyone want to volunteer to go first to be the poet? Seeds, red. Watermelon. Wow. Well, nicely done. That was really impressive. So now let's reflect on this. This is a little bit more complex uh, in terms of communication, both on the the giving out giving of the message, putting the message out, but also uh, guessing and, and uh, listening. So the example, of the question type of the question you might use, and would love to hear your responses. You know, how did you feel during this game? What did you notice? about how different people approached it? Were certain types of descriptions more helpful for you? And then you know, how might you imply, uh, apply these insights to, uh, to your work, to better understanding yourself or maybe messaging in a different way or understanding other people in a different way? I thought it was interesting that um, some people did like the machine gun where it's like, okay, boom, here's something, you don't get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. And then you kind of had to put them all together, you know, to, to, to come up with it. And then there were other people who they had one, and then you kind of thought about it, and then you had another one. And I don't know if that was intentional, but I feel like I'm imagining in the workplace that that would be something that you might notice more often in like communication style or the way that you interact with people, like you were waiting, you're, you're comfortable in silence or you're comfortable waiting for feedback versus like, it felt like other folks were just like, all right, boom, you're gonna figure this out. Like it's on you now, like I'm done. Yeah, that's a great insight. And there's so much 
I feel like now the idea of storytelling is woven in so much to communication of even if you're giving instructions um, or if you're giving feedback, can you do it in terms of a story? So there's some arc. And so do, are there people that think more intuitively in that way versus think more in terms of like a bulleted list of just going through and, and making sure all the information gets out there, but not necessarily uh, how it fits together. Um, and similarly on, on both of those and anywhere along those continuums, some people are gonna be more receptive uh, to one or the other, find um, you know different versions more helpful. Yeah, that was a great insight. I found that this game did that thing for me that I really want uh, games to do, which is it, it makes me feel a sense of like immersion. Like I just get the information and then I get to go into my head and pull it apart and, you know, kind of ignore people and just focus on the content which it reminds me a little bit of like flow state and chick sent me high and you know, you lose track of time and space and you, so I, yeah, it, it hasn't struck me that that's a real difference in different types of games for me because some of them are very social, but this one I did not find social really at all. It, I mean, it was a little, a little funny, but mostly I was just like, give me the pieces of the puzzle and let me work it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a, a a great conversation point is you know the mechanics of the game. So there, there's there's two two sides of the game. There's the game mechanics. What are the different um, uh, activities or bits ty types of information that are needed? And then there's what are the interpersonal dynamics that result from from those mechanics? And first identifying what what those components are within a game and then how people respond to them and why does some people respond more favorably, less favorably, more inspiring, less inspiring, more connecting, less connecting uh, to those and just trying to figure out why is that? You know, there are people who really like that type of puzzle game and there are people who hate it and think, you know, would, would liken it to uh you know like mental torture um and and so why is that and how do those preferences show up in other situations yeah it also reminds me why i'm partially why i'm so obsessed with facilitation and workshops is because oftentimes what you're doing is you're gamifying analytic tasks um you know you're giving people the bounds of i want you to think about it on these dimensions and run with it and some people really mm -hmm. thrive within that. And then sometimes yeah. you're changing the game to be very interpersonal and you're doing something complex and interactive and it requires, you know, that intimacy. Um, but yeah, that's, I, yeah. Ethan, you had something? Yeah, I think um, I, I, I would love to like meld this with the categories of like, it felt to me like it was a race to get, who could get the right answer first um, instead of like, I want to hear what every, like, great Game of Thrones, you know, like what, you know, what, <laughs> what word comes to mind if that's all the prompt that I've given and, and what does everybody think? And is there, you know, I, d just games where there's like a, a speedy right answer are less collaborative. And so, yes, to, to like, how do you make it more, you know, like, introspective or intimate in that like everybody's going to have to contribute or like we you know meaningfully go around and hear like what did that come what came up for you when you heard that um as a mm -hmm. as a better way to warm up a, a room instead of like jockey for position or score points you know on on somebody um i would just love to like i like it when when a game kind of asks for participation actively from the whole crowd audibly right i think people are you know mentally yeah. things but like how do i expose the how, how do i make visible that invisible internal process that's so good yeah I, yeah i wanted to add on to that like in our house we have mostly cooperative games which means that you all win together or you all lose together um 
but we also have types of games in which everybody gets the opportunity to work on their own little puzzle. Um, you know, like I think Azul is an example of that, but there's a couple of them where it's like everybody has, and you're collaborating, but everybody also still gets the opportunity to feel like they did something and it, and it was fun in the experience and it was fun in the output. Um, and it's, it also reminds me why, like, I do like competitive games, but I hate Monopoly. I despise Monopoly because Monopoly is just, you know, it's it, whoever comes out ahead in a certain period of time just gets to just torture everybody for the remaining course of the game. They just all have to live They're in the like 12 hours that it takes. To yeah. Play a and, the, game. and, and you're all living in the capitalist dystopia that's being lorded over by the, the person who's obviously going to win. And I'm like, no, let's end it. Yeah. Um, Ethan, I love what you said. I mean, you're already thinking like a game facilitator. Um, And one of the things, especially when you get to, I mean, sort of a great segue, we can come back to this reflective conversation, but going into the, the development is playing some sort of game and then asking, what would you do differently next time? Um, and it could be to 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 make it faster, to include more people, to make it more fun, to um, you know leverage different strengths, and getting people to think because everybody's going to have once you've played something once and there's that reaction to it, everybody's going to say, oh well, if I knew then what I know now, you know I would X Y Z. Um, and those are such valuable information that's so rarely shared in the real world. And so just practicing having those conversations and saying, okay, like let's try implementing some of those ideas and, and see what happens and, and getting into that experiential um, and experimental mindset um, is really valuable. Although I don't know, set with someone like Daniel is there who won't let you make the rules a little bit different. Uh, you might get some pushback, but that's a really it's a really great way to activate that experiential learning cycle. Like, great, let's let's pick out one particular variable, let's change it up and and see what happens. Yeah, I uh I wanted to call an audible on our time here because uh, I know you had a third game, but are we we're we're scheduled to go until um in fifteen minutes? Is that right? Uh, yes, and we okay. if people are up for a third game. Um, we have time for it. If... Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was sort it? of, I was sort of curious if we wanted to um, do a game or because I I would like to end with open discussion um, as is kind of our standard um, to see if there's additional sure. feedback from the group. Um, so if you're okay with um, with that one, if, if you wanted to just open with reflections on that, um, the third game that you were going to do, because I am really curious to dig into this aspect in particular, because it was something that we discussed previously. Um, which aspect? The... the the third type of game and using- Oh yeah, the team the... development. Yeah. yeah, and this is actually a, a very, very quick and simple um simple game so we can do it in about three minutes and then we'll oh, have sweet. Uh, yeah, time good. to reflect um and this actually gets at the point we're just making about having a situation and thinking about what you would do differently um so we'll just do we're gonna do two rounds we'll just do one round um are people familiar with the annotate feature in zoom where you can draw on the screen um you should see at the top of your screen, there's a little green box. It says you're viewing Alex's screen. And then there's a little drop down menu there. It says view options or see more options. Um, and one of those options is called annotate. And if you open up that menu, it gives you, you can have a pen or a marker or draw shapes. Um, and it'll let everybody, uh, everybody see the screen. Uh, see the markups you make to the screen. I'm going to play around with that. And 
let me know if you're having trouble finding it. I found it. I drew an arrow pointing at where I found the box. Perfect. Um, Craig, it looks like you found it. Put an arrow on the screen. Excellent. People are finding it. So how what this game works called Visionary. Uh, it's a collaborative game. And one person is going to be have the role of the visionary. And I'll send that person a link in the chat to a picture online. And the visionary's job is to describe that picture in any words, any level of detail. There's no um, there's no limits on what can be said. Um, but everybody else is working collaboratively to create that picture in the blank space on the screen. Um, so to, to draw it. And so there's that element of listening to instructions and acting on them. There's an element of coordination and collaboration uh, because you're all trying to put one picture together. And there's going to be a two minute timer on the screen so that uh, there's a little bit of external pressure there. So. Would anybody, um, anybody want to volunteer to be the visionary? I'll do it if nobody else wants. All right. And everyone else is going to be the drawer. And let me just clear the screen and Daniel whenever you're ready and again you can say there's no limits on what you can or can't say uh, to describe this picture I'm asking I'm just describing it so that everybody draws it as accurately as possible um, you could choose if you want the goal to be accuracy if you want it to be just getting one element of it um you can okay you can totally choose all right what i'm looking at is uh, oh wait hold on let me just make sure draw any questions from the drawers all right i'm going to start the timer uh i'm looking at a the head of a bird that takes up about one third of this canvas. Um, and it's, it's neck kind of extends out up like, uh, <laughs> it extends up from, from the bottom of the, of the canvas. And it, it looks like a, like a spring almost. And it's blue. It's a blue bird. It's got this, uh, yeah, it's got this twirly spring neck uh, with its, be it's facing to the left though. And it's it has like a long beak, longer than that. And the beak is blue. Okay. A blue, a long blue beak and make, and like a, maybe a, Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, and it's got, a, so you can see like the mouth and the beak. So just like one line sort of bisecting that that mouth. There you go. All right. It has giant big eyes sort of facing to the left. Really big eyes with, with the, you know, yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, and then its hair, it has a tuft of, it has two, two of those eyes. So with, you know, the pupils in the middle, but they're small pupils. And the, the hair comes off the top in this, in like feathery, big feathery tuft. We got five seconds to do to do feathery. <laughs> Fantastic. So here's the picture. Uh, so I think the beak and the eyes are pretty accurate. It's all blue. Got a good start to the feathery tufts. 
Um, I'm going to just make a, take a screenshot yeah. of this. Uh, I could send it to you after. It's pretty close, um, yeah. Yeah, I think you have the most important components are, are definitely there. Um, yeah, was, but that, you can... The neck description was, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> It was a little rough. I wasn't sure how to even describe what's happening there. Yeah. And so with this, you know, there's an element of working together and listening to each other. And, you know, to what Ethan suggested at the end of the last game is like, what would you do differently if you were to do this again? How could you approach it? Whether it's the way the instructions are given or what roles people take on. Uh, there's so many different ways to use this to talk about process, uh, to talk about um, talk about structure, to talk about culture and expectations, and and a lot of those insights can then, or a lot of those suggestions are also applicable in how people work together um, within the workplace. So this one has, a, even though it's a really simple exercise, it has a lot of very um, uh, very directly applicable um, uses. And so, you know, these might be some of the reflection questions. We were going to do two rounds, but over a couple of rounds, you know, how did the different rounds compare? What different approaches did you notice? If you were to do this again, you know, what would help better communication or collaboration, coordination, um, and how can you apply these insights? Um, so I guess with that, I'll just open it up to questions, thoughts, um, I could stay on a little after two thirty if uh, anybody else can. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll be hanging out for a little while if people want to want to hang back. Um, yeah, I'll I'll let other people speak first if they want to talk about the game. Can you put the questions back, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is uh, just my like role in the facilitation space. I always, uh, skip over the, like, is everybody comfortable doing the thing I'm about to ask you to, like, you have to be able to draw on this canvas in order to participate. And, you know, I saw Craig and I doing stuff, but like, is that because we jumped in and uh, nobody else was comfortable or was it because like actually other people aren't in and you, you know, confident using the tool. <clears throat> um, and so like how I, I hallucinate digital confidence <laughs> in my participants often that like, Hey, you're here and you're excited to be here. So like, you've probably done something like this before. And so you're just going to do it. Um, but that like, especially in the virtual space, like, hey, this is cool. But like, uh, I, and there's a joke that my my mentor says, um, you know, everybody here, draw a picture of your spouse. And I'll, I'll tell the age at which you stopped practicing how to draw. <laughs> like, the just like the all of our competencies are developmental. And so, you know, do we feel shame or guilt that like, I don't know, I'm not very good at this. And like, am I gonna be be able to participate publicly at some in something that like i'm you know obviously i just started trying to learn how to draw on the whiteboard um so i think those those are the two mm -hmm. things that are that are coming up for me is like you know should there be multiple canvases and again is everybody trying to draw what they hear or is there one version that we're all collaborating on yeah if we had more time the first round would have been everybody just pen and paper doing their own sketch just to get comfortable with what do you listen for? What type of details are helpful? Uh, what pace should the instructions be? And then you know, once reflected on that, then move to the round where people are working together. And so how do you, based on what different people need, how can we approach it differently? Um, and it, something that comes up more often than than you might think is uh, with the first round with this, when once we get to collaborative, especially if it's virtual, uh, the two minutes will go by and there's nothing on the canvas at all. 
and it's whether nobody there's not psychological safety where so no one wants to make the first move or people don't want to draw and and are too afraid of you know looking stupid or you know how are they going to be evaluated um it, it's really interesting to to see what what assumptions and and what feelings and thoughts are going through people's heads yeah i'd be curious like to break down cuz i think of um I know in facilitation, you use, you know, warm up activities often from like improv or some facilitators do this stuff. I, I don't tend to do the fun warm ups. I do more academic ones. But when you do those, you get people to exercise just the action of stepping into vulnerability, right? It's like the game is, and then people are laughing about it. So it increases people's sense of safety. But it's like, one thing I think about is uh, when you are in the habit of turning things into games or you're in the habit of, you know, like the free association games that we play with some of my friends at work, um, then like silliness is, is totally acceptable behavior. It's a totally acceptable stand in for substance, right? Which it also applies to all of our interactions. If I'm like, I don't have a serious response to this, I'll be like, what's the silly response? And I'll do that, which as a, almost like as a, a reflex, just increases the quantity of our interactions, right? Which you're more likely to get interesting insights. But it also means when I'm like, I have an idea and I'm like, oh, this might be stupid. I'm like, I say stupid things constantly. Why would that ever stop me? I, this is what we do around here. We say stupid things because it makes us laugh, right? Yeah. And that's the thing I want to roll. I'll take on a lot as the facilitator is like, I'm not afraid to look stupid or I'm not afraid to like give the bad example to sort of be like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? <laughs> um, yeah. And and often that will bring some of the tension down and, and make people feel more comfortable. <clears throat> yeah. Any there. other thoughts or, oh, let me share for purple jump off. Um, I'll put my uh, contact information or how to find my contact because I'd love to connect if anyone wants to talk more about this afterwards. Um, I um, love talking about games. This reminded me of um, another drawing activity. It's not a game per se. I don't know. I don't know what the boundary of game is in my mind. Um, but half the, like one half of the room is told you're going to, I'm going to like tell you to draw a thing. And the other half of the room is going to give it be given slightly separate set of instructions um and like people who are being told to draw something ignore my the sound of my voice over the next two minutes and so they're the, that first group is said like draw a teacup and then the other set is told to first for 10 seconds draw two sketches of you know something hot and then two sketches of something on a saucer and then two sketches of a teacup and in between those 10 second sketches, share with a friend what you drew and what it looks like. And it's the comp, it's like the comparison of one high fidelity, you know, version versus like many iterative um, approaches. And like the compare and contrast of like the, the quality of the result if you if you do something small with not all the features and get feedback versus, hey, you know, fully build out a requirement, which is you know, what a teacup might look like. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy that. Like, that's one of my favorite, like little warm ups to, hey, why are why is iteration important? Why is sharing before it's done important? Why is breaking something down into its component pieces or, or assumptions important? Uh, this reminded me. Yeah. Of that. Yeah. I like that exercise. I want to try that. Um, I, any other I had, thoughts or questions or yeah yeah i had another thing which what one of the things i wanted to talk about today when we did this is that 
<laughs> I think this relates to that third type of game, that team, that development type of game. Um, I think I mentioned to you I had, um, well, well I, in the military we have war gaming, which is a whole mm -hmm. thing, and and I'm not that familiar with with war gaming, but I, I got into I got it into my head that we could, um, we could use games as a method of practicing interpersonal dynamics within a right within a bounded space and constrained environment, but also within that environment, we are playing roles that are kind of often not ourselves. So we get to be this other person for this period of time it reminds me of Greg Galley of uh, solve next. He talks about within facilitation, there's the now rules and then there's the next rules and you create a container where the rules are different. Right. Which is a lot of what facilitation is. It's like in this environment, we are not our ranks, right? We are not the people, we are not our backgrounds. We are this other thing, right? Um, but the thought that I had when was, I'm a big fan of the game Pandemic as something that just ratchets up interpersonal tension, right? And there's risks obviously involved in putting people into an environment where you ratchet up tension. But a lot of times I, I've never seen it really go badly unless somebody's kind of like emotionally immature. But the thought I had was that as an aspect of professional military education, we could be using games to give people reps in handling difficult interpersonal dynamic situations. For example, yeah. you know, and I thought I went, my mind went immediately to pandemic because it's like, nobody gets to be in charge. You have to figure out how to coordinate together to deal with what is often a very stressful situation, right? It's like the pandemic. They do a really good, that game is so well designed to make the participants worried about all the, the things that are emerging. And so, yeah, it was like, I just had this idea that we could we could be using games in training as well as on teams, right? So teams can build the muscle movement, the muscle memory necessary to to handle real world. And that was one thing that was really inspired by um, from your work was like, you know, and I, I started asking if people wanted to collaborate on this. And I, I think that they got pulled away, but it, it was just, it's a curiosity I still have. Yeah, I mean, I think especially when it comes to developing um, sort of management and leadership skills and not even for, for people in, in formal positions, but just like how do you influence other people um, and sort of get that buy-in. And you could tell, you can explain the skills and how to do it conceptually but in order to get people to, to change their behavior, because that's like adopting any new skill uh, or, you know, trying any new way of communication, that's scary. It's behavior change. It's it's really stepping out of our boundaries. And so just practicing explaining things to people, you know, just practicing giving instructions is so valuable. And especially when you can practice that with the people that you're actually going to be giving instructions to so that you have a better understanding of how are they receiving it? What do they need to hear to feel like they understand the information? Um, it's it's wild to me how much of that that training around those types of competencies is still done in such a sort of academic, theoretical, purely knowledge based format um, without a lot of interaction. I think there's so much. Um, there's so much money that's wasted on trainings that are not designed around getting behavior changed. Like getting the knowledge out is like the smallest and easiest part of driving learning and change. Yeah. We did a project for the space force. I think I probably already mentioned this to you, Alex, in a conversation, but where they were asking us to help them identify what their priorities were for professional military education for NCOs. And one thing I really honed in on was, can we differentiate between those things you value, which require implicit knowledge and those things which require explicit knowledge? 
because most of the way that we teach people, it's as though the only thing we need is explicit knowledge. We're handing people information that they're just supposed to recall and apply to a situation, but implicit knowledge or reflex is experience is gained experientially, right? Uh, is through regular reps. And uh, I, so weirdly, we recently started, we're going to jump into some of the Space Forces PME here um, in a couple of weeks, Austin and I, Austin was on the call earlier, because based on some of the work that we did, they've changed, they're trying out a different way of doing PME, which is much more like facil facilitative as opposed to get them to, you know, the old model where it's just like, here's the information we need you to be able to regurgitate. Uh, and, and they're getting much more into what is the experience we need people to have here that they're going to yeah. emerge the, you know, at least capable of becoming the leaders we need because probably in five weeks, they're not, you're not going to create the leaders you need. Five weeks is too short. It takes a lifetime. Right. But <laughs> There's such a tension there, Daniel. Um, I just did a workshop with Craig actually for BathWorks fellows in the virtual environment and like very experiential virtual environment. So like the habits that people are bringing with them that say like, I'm in a training, where's the manual of all the information I need? And like, now you're asking me to do something different than that. And now do I trust you? And how am I gonna be about? And like, I it's just like this perfect storm of is it dogma on my part that I believe games are a better way to learn? <laughs> How, like, where is the, wh and then, you know, talking to Wendy Walsh or somebody like that, it's like, show me the academic study that has been done to prove that this works instead yeah. of, I'm trying to be playful and I want to encourage both that mindset and also, you know, I don't know, it's, for me, it's that like, is there, and I'm, I'm reading the book both and right so like it feels it feels to me very either or at the moment like either we play and it's frivolous or we're serious and it's toilsome and i'm looking for that like um both and solution where um you know i, I got this question actually and craig was also at, at edwards with me um people we did very experiential things and still people were like okay but what should i have learned from that <laughs> tell me the right answer for having had this experience. And I was just like, man, I, I get where you're coming from. You like, you want me, the expert to tell you how you should have felt instead of like your, your experience being authentic and meaningful. And the answer was what you took away from it. Um, but I'm, I'm stuck in that space right now of introducing game full and gamified elements, but then at the end people saying, okay, but, what was the answer? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's where like, um, so we do a little sort of play facilitator certification and like a big piece of it is like how it is incorporating games into broader initiatives because some people can get everything they need from the experience, but some people need like, okay, well, what's the framework? And let's give a couple of, exa of examples of, you know, here's some like case studies and then let's try it. And then let's reflect on how the experience tied back to uh, the the more traditional training type. Uh, and, and I think that's where, um, that's the real value in just using it as yet another tool to, to help people understand or, or reinforce concepts or help with that transition of, of turning knowledge into practice. Yeah, I feel like anytime you try and introduce the concept of targets, then all education falls into the good hearts law trap of, you know, uh, measures become targets, and then they are no longer useful measures. Um, if there is a correct answer um then uh then everybody's going to be aiming for that because that's what they're going to be judged on right and the people coming into your training experience rely on you to give them the tools to achieve the thing they're going to be judged on so everybody is like under the everybody's heavily uh constrained by just the fact that there is a hidden target 
to behave in ways that are super unhelpful. Well, and that's where without building in some part of like self-awareness and reflection at the beginning, you'll know like, what's my baseline in this thing that I'm about to learn? Um, and what's, what's my style? I mean, you can tell when someone is using, you know, to communication, like a communication style that they learned from a, a course or a book, but haven't thought at all about how do I adapt this to make sense from me. And it's so, you could tell it's inauthentic. It feels very stilted. You could tell the person's uncomfortable delivering it. And so if there's no, like, how do you make this work for you? Get into that mindset of, of you know, how you would really use this and how this fits within the broader context. And um, yeah, I, mean, it, I think the word is, is very overused, but the idea of authenticity is so important. Um, it's not, a, again, not a game in my mind. Uh, because I, I again I'm not sure where the boundary of game is, but the the Mercury meetings that we have, um, I try and start with the like nine blocks of like it's cow emoji faces and like tell tell me which cow you are today in your mm -hmm. in your one sentence intro, um, and that's it's playful. It's again like I don't know if it's a game or not following rules or scoring, but like. Um, just that like, hey, let me arrive and and engage in something that's fun. Or like, yeah. even if it's me picking the cow that's like, looks like they're having a bad day. Like, oh, I get to laugh at like, hush, oh, it's here I am today again, you know, like I've been here before, I know how to get out. But um, mm -hmm. so I think the the thing that I am, am interested in is like, how do I facilitate that for myself. I think that like I try and facilitate it for other people, but like, um, I don't know, the self-reflection of like, I work at home by myself in my office and like, other than occasionally coming to the Agitari facility, you know, whatever, like I don't have a whole lot of gameful community because there's nobody in my work. Mm -hmm. I don't go anywhere for work, um, but like, well, what maybe a... the Atari community would want to do like a quarterly game session, which is like playing a game together and like giving everybody a chance to. Honestly, quarterly doesn't doesn't sound often enough to me, but yeah, I because <laughs> I, it sounds so good. I love playing games. I actually yeah. was just thinking about getting back into like Jackbox Party Pack. I don't know if you ever played that stuff, but they're really fun. Mm -hmm. It's like on Zoom and stuff. But I'm constantly trying to find opportunities to play games with people. Like I play, you know, online video games with friends and drag people to my house to play tabletop games. Um, yeah, I I don't think I ever, until recently, realized how much how important like games are in my life. But it, you know, this is part of why I really appreciated running into you, Alex, is because. It's just kind of like a thing that was, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to play Mario on, you know, whatever. But, but also there's video games and video games now, like I could go, I could talk at length about some of my favorite, you know, like computer games and how immersive and affecting they are, right? Like emotionally mm -hmm. and storytelling and artistically and all of that, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. And then the social factor is also huge now. Like I play online games with people. <laughs> um, yeah, Rouse yeah. has gotten a, a a view of some of that silliness. Yeah. And even just stopping and being like, okay, I'm playing this game and I'm really into it. Why? Do, what is it that I like about it? Yeah. Just in ourselves, there's really valuable insights there. Yeah, it is. It is funny that often and one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently because I've been playing Rocket League a little bit, which is a hyper competitive sports type game, and I really, I really enjoy it. But one thing I've noticed is um, there's like a real dark side to online games nowadays, especially in the really competitive ones where people lose their whole lives, get sucked into trying to perfect their game and and like get and rank up. And they 
and I think it's actually really uh, bad. I think it's actually hurting people's lives in a lot of these contexts, especially when they become streamers and they're trying to make a living with it. Um, I've just seen it go really wrong in a lot of ways, but yeah. I didn't have a one of the probably the best there. conference I've ever been to. There's this uh it's called NASAGA, the North American Simulation and Gaming Association. It's a really small uh group and their conference. I don't think there was a single session that didn't involve doing some type of game or activity um and and talking about it at length. And every night there's just like open game night and people have different board games at different types of games um and you just play and uh one of the games that um, that I played there was called Blood on the Clock Tower. It's sort of like werewolf, like a social deduction game and brilliantly conceived game, a uh, cool story. I hated it. I hated every second of it. And I, I, I made myself finish the game. Like I actually played the, you know, the whole thing and then spent a lot of time thinking about why. And what I realized was when I play games with people, I want to get to know them. I want to have a, a, a fun and positive experience for everybody. And in those social deduction games, deception is built into it. Um, and you don't know who's lying. There's that mistrust. And I hate that feeling. And part of it is, is not thinking it's fun, but part of it is I think there's so much of that in the world that it wasn't, the game wasn't escapist for me. I, I was like, this game, the name, they should change the name to like Gaslight the game. Um, and, and that was like such a big revelation for me in terms of, okay, well, when I'm playing games for fun, these are games that I just need to avoid and not get myself into. And I can watch other people playing it, but I really didn't like the feelings and the insights that it was raising within, within me. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. I, uh, I was actually going to bring up Secret Hitler and Ethan put it in there. I don't know that I... one. It's a really interesting game. And the whole point is to lie to each other. Like, and it just doesn't, do, do you like have a really negative experience with that, Ethan? Um, I just disengage and then everybody thinks I'm secret Hitler because I don't, I refuse to, to actively play. I just like, I don't know. It's, it's outside of my, uh, I can't just play the role and say like, oh, it's just for fun that I lied to you straight for 35 minutes. I'm like, this feels like I'm a, <laughs> I'm a sociopath. Like I don't, I just, anyways, it, I so can't. That was my experience with Blood on the Clock Tower. And, you know, saying, you know, I was trying to be honest in my character and like got emotional and people were like, oh, now she seems like she's acting and that's making her even more suspicious. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not suspicious. Like I'm telling you that I'm not suspicious. And they're like, oh, that's what a guilty person would say. And I, that was maybe one of the most uncomfortable, even though it was in the context of the game, the, one of the most uncomfortable situations I've ever been in. And I was like, this is literally what I have nightmares about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rouse, Rouse put it in the chat, but we were once I got secret Hitler as a gift and I was trying to, we tried to play it at our house one time with a bunch of people and Rouse, who is a sociopath said she made up a bunch of rules and said she was telling us the rules to the game. And I had, <laughs> I, I was playing secret Hitler in real life. I was she re yeah. secretly <laughs> She was gaslighting us. It was like meta gaslighting. It was and I got I'm really good at games. I got really <laughs> upset cuz I was like this is my first chance to play this game and so, <laughs> so now it's a, it's a real sore spot for me. I really I really broke his trust that day. Yeah. We've never recovered. We haven't. It's true. We to this day we have not played that game. I played it with other people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Um, I was gonna yeah, say the, the game one night, which uh I played pretty frequently with an old uh a former team of uh colleagues had a, a similar impact of <laughs> 
you know, it's a game based around deception, similarly. And w there were some really, really fascinating social experiences where, you know, at the end of the game, everyone is revealed. And you could watch people learn things about each other that they could not unlearn. <laughs> like, people who lied really well, who you would not have expected, uh, was the most common one. And I thought it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, I, I think there's so much, there's a lot of missed opportunity with games because you can go so deep in in reflecting on them and drawing on them and seeing those larger patterns um, and, and different opportunities for, for learning, for sort of meta understanding and awareness. Yeah, I did also want to say um, earlier when, when Holter brought up uh, things like wargaming and stuff the military uses gaming for, uh, one of my um, formal military trainings, I went to a, a school for uh, the 1 Charlie 3 Command Post Tech School, which the, the culmination of that training is you go into a, a simulated command center and they run you through a several hour scenario where they're feeding you a bunch of inputs and, you know, developing a scenario. So it's essentially just one long drawn out game. Uh, and then if you pass, you know, if you're good at that game, you graduate is sort of the deal. And uh, I really, it's, it's really well done. Like shout out to those instructors. It's a really well executed program. But one of the things that I was, um, really interested in, in learning more about after the fact was for the, for the instructors and people who develop these scenarios, they are, I mean, this is their full-time job, right? And they are all in, they create an immersive, like fully immersive world. They have a cast of characters, many of whom have backstories and it's just them mm -hmm. in this control room behind the sim calling in, they're doing voices, you know, they're, they're, they're fully in it. And it's a, and it's a, I think a six week course. So they've done this, many of them, you know, dozens of times over the course of, of a tour there. And some of the interesting things that developed for them as they iterate these scenarios or some of the things that I was really interested in was things like the way they would feed certain information. Every character that they had and every input that they designed it wasn't just we have to test your ability to run these checklists or respond to these scenarios correctly, but they also changed the ways that, you know, different levels of command would call, you know, they're, they're pretending to be these different levels of command and they'd call these airmen and be really aggressive because they wanted to see how they would respond to that stress. Alternatively, sometimes they would call and be very relaxed, but the information that they were that they were giving the airmen was something that they needed to respond to urgently. And they wanted to see if they could interpret that based on not the tone in the voice, but the words that they were speaking. And so they were evaluating, uh, they were giving a much more nuanced evaluation than what I had expected when I walked into it. And so I think that was my first, that was, that was a little over 10 years ago. And that was my first kind of glimpse at what a really, sophisticated game could could do for our ability to to evaluate and to train and to reflect and all the things you're talking about yeah uh, my partners and i um have created uh a couple of different simulations we use uh the work setting of an amusement park um because there are real work concerns but it's a more whimsical environment um, and so it takes people out of the reality of where they actually work. Um, and it's escape room like in that there's different pieces to figure out and it takes different types of knowledge and different ways of communicating. Um, and there's there's a lot of variations for how you can do it where sometimes you have people have individual goals that might conflict with the shared goal um, or people's individual goals might be in conflict with each other and how do they navigate it um and i mean those were 
predominantly we use them in that team development level. Um, and it's so powerful. It's it's really fascinating to watch how people take it very, very serious, how seriously people take it with not a whole lot of prompting. Um, and, and that's even, you know, we don't do a lot of the immersive things or, you know, people aren't given specific, or, or a lot of times they're not given like specific roles and, and sort of broader context and people just dive right in and, and show up as they are. It's really fascinating. Yeah, that sounds super cool. Well, I'm certainly what? up for leading editorial game sessions if that's the people think would be fun and maybe maybe uh other people won't have games they want to bring but that could be a really cool thing to bring into the community that sounds so wonderful and i will definitely follow up with you on on what we could do there because um yeah i'm always looking for more groups of people to play different games with um so um yeah i we will definitely follow up on that I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and call it, uh, cause we're at two hours and I just thank you so much, Alex, for taking the time. This has been wonderful. And you, you have the, um, you have the distinction of being our first, uh, Agitari event of the year and the first one in, in quite a while. And it was, um, it was excellent and wonderful. And I'm walking away with tons of notes and inspiration. So and thank you everybody well, for yeah happy up. to talk more about this anytime so thanks reach Thank out you. i'm on the, the editor slack and everything all right wonderful cool. well thanks everybody remember to be engaged in chat and uh, we will see you around thanks thanks very Bye. much <laughs>